Hi, my name is Mrs. Tessa Rose Mahmoudi, and today we're going to talk about plant taxonomy. There's a lot of plants out there which can get really overwhelming when you're trying to identify different plants. But if you understand the basics of the hierarchy system that plant scientists use to name plants, you'll be better equipped for identifying the plant family that plant is in and eventually the genus and the species. When you're identifying a plant, it's helpful to look at characteristic features such as the leaf shape. Let's go over an example of basil, poison ivy, and strawberries. Each of these have very different uses, but from a distance, the leaves could look semi-similar. Notice that the leaf shape is different in each one of these, including the leaf margin, which is the outer edge of the leaf. You'll also notice that poison ivy and strawberry have three leaflets to make a compound leaf. It's important to Take note of that, since basil does not have that, these have simple leaves, but there's more distinguishing features to look at, such as how the plant itself is growing. Strawberries are growing close to the ground, where poison ivy can look a little bit more bushy and sometimes grow as a vine. Basil's plants always grow upright. If the plant happens to be flowering, that can be even more helpful for identifying the plant. Let's take a look at these same plants, but when they're flowering. You can see that their flower shape is very unique along with color and size. Take note about also how many petals the plant has because that can help you identify the plant family. You'll notice that each of these plants has a common name that you're probably pretty familiar with, basil, poison ivy, strawberry. Underneath you'll see a scientific name, which is the binomial name of the plant, which might be a little bit less familiar. Scientific names are really important, however, because common names can be different depending on who you're talking to. For example, this common house plant has many different common names. It's sometimes called snake plant, and other times it's called mother-in-law's tongue. This can get really confusing if you're talking to somebody about the same plant. You may be talking about the same plant with just different names. That's why scientific names are so important to use because you'd be calling your collaborator and say, I'm doing a scientific research project on mother-in-law's tongue, and I need you to send me some samples from your region. They would be very grossed out by you and say, uh, I'm not participating in your scientific research project. So you wanna be careful to use the scientific names because scientific names gives precision and the universal name. Scientific names not only give precision, but they also help you if you're talking to somebody from a different culture or language. Because scientific names are universal, if you're talking to somebody whose native language is Chinese or Spanish or English, the scientific name will be the same. The common names, however, will be very different, and a direct translation of the common name might not be the common name in that other language. Taxonomy is the branch of botany that uses this different classification system to name plants. People who work to name plants are called taxonomists. The taxonomist that originally developed this naming system's name is Linnaeus. So the system that we use today date back to 250 years ago when Linnaeus developed the system. Of course, the system has been improved upon and added to, but the roots of it come from Linnaeus. Let's talk about this classification. We start with kingdom, then subkingdom, then superdivision, phylum, division, class, order, genus, species. You may have learned a fun way to memorize this as a child, but we're going to go through this specifically and how it relates to plants. So first, the kingdom that we're talking about is plants. The subkingdoms that we differentiate plants into is the vascular plants, which is what most plants are, and then non-vascular plants. So what's a vascular system is what we need to ask ourselves. A vascular system is something that some plants have and some plants don't. A vascular system is a transport system within the plant to transport water and another pipe for transporting sugars, xylem and phloem. Plants like liverwort and moss do not have these vascular systems, which causes them to be very short in stature. That's why you'll never see a very tall moss plant or liverwort plant, because they're non-vascular plants. Non-vascular plants have to live in special ecosystems where they're going to get lots of water. 
since they can't transport water from their roots. Vas Non-vascular plants will live underneath a waterfall example or on a side wall which gets a lot of moisture. Since they don't have roots and pipes to transport the water and nutrients, they need to stay short. The superdivision then goes off of the vascular plants. Most plants are vascular plants. And in this section, we have seedless plants and seed plants. A seedless example of a plant is fern. Ferns have other way to sexually reproduce. Underneath plants that have seeds, there's different ways that those seeds um, are held by that plant. For example, angiosperm seeds are enclosed within a fruit, whereas gymnosperm plants have naked seeds. Some examples of gymnosperms are pine trees and ginkgo trees. Angiosperm examples are fruit trees, strawberries, uh, daisies, lilies, all these different types of plants that you are very familiar with. Angiosperms are broken down into two different classes, monocotyledons and dicotyledons. You'll notice monocotyledon and dicotyledon both have this common word, which is cotyledon. So what's a cotyledon? A cotyledon is an embryonic leaf, which the first leaves appear from the seed. So these first leaves are within the seed. In a monocot, the monocot will germinate and one leaf will come out and first be visible. In a dicot, the seed will germinate and two leaves will come and be visible. We call them monocot, which means one, cot, cotyledon, and dicot, which di means two. There's some other differentiating features of monocots and dicots that you can tell when the plant is older. For instance, the root system monocots is fibrous, which means it's kind of more messy, whereas in a dicot root, there's one main tap root with secondary roots coming off. The vascular system, those important pipes that we talked about earlier, are different in monocots and dicots as well. The monocot has a vascular system, uh, vasculature that's scattered, whereas in the dicot, it's very um, ringed and more organized. The veins of a dicot leaf are net-like, whereas they're all parallel in a monocot leaf. So this is a really the, the most common way to detect is by the leaves. The flower petal number is also different. So in monocots, they usually have multiples of three petals, whereas dicots have multiples of four or five. Monocots are usually non-woody plants with short stems, and they often have overlapping leaves that are in a whorl, and this is called a rosette. We've talked about that previously. Some examples of monocots are grasses, lilies, irises, onions, cattails, and most flowering bulbs. Dicots grow into larger sized shrubs and trees. Then we're going to talk about plant families, which is the next section of this hierarchy system that we've been going over. Let's talk about grass family. Grass family is a very large family with plants such as corn, sorghum, orchid, orchard grass, quack grass, and foxtails. The legume family has things like alfalfa, white clover, vetch. The rose family is very diverse, having things like apple trees, cherry trees, pears, raspberries, and strawberries. The gourd family has squash, cucumber, pumpkins, and melons. Whereas the nightshade family has things like potato, tomato, eggplant, tobacco, black nightshade, and ground cherry. If we take a minute to talk about the legume family, you'll note that in this family, there's just some distinguishing features such as similar flower shape and leaflets to form compounds of compound leaves with three leaflets. But these plants in this family also have an amazing superpower, which is called nitrogen fixation. Basically, the legume plants form this special relationship with bacteria and the bacteria helps them take nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert that nitrogen into a form of nitrogen that the plant can actually use. This is why legume plants have a very important ecological role. Let's talk about the daisy family a little bit. The daisy family has 1,600 different genera and 23 1,600 different species. Some examples are sunflowers, cockleburrs, and safflower, which is how we make saffron, and marigold. 
I'm going to give you a specific example of marigolds in a second, but first I need to introduce the next subsection, which is genus and species. The binomial naming system of plants, which we call the scientific name, is two names. Latin for by, to, and nomen, name, binomial naming system. The first name is the genus, and the second is the species, or epiphyte. So for ease of understanding, I want you to think of it as the first name and the last name. But unlike us, which we have first names that distinguish us from our other siblings that may have the same last name as us, in plants, it's opposite. So the last name comes first and then the first name. The species is also an epiphyte. What's an epiphyte? An epiphyte is an adjective or descriptive phrase expressing a quality or characteristic of the person, or in this case, the plant. So epiphyte is what's describing it, which is the species. For example, within marigold genus, which is tagetes, we will have different types of marigolds. For example, these are very small thumbnail sized blossoms, whereas this is a very large blossom, such as a fist sized blossom. So although they're both marigolds, they're so unlike that they're giving different specific epiphytes. So petula and erecta and hence they're different species. So we both have, they're in the same genus, and they're in the same family, which is in the daisy family, but they have different species. So same family, which is daisy family, same genus, which is tagatas, but different species. Let's go through and review what we've covered so far for our lovely example of mother-in-law's tongue. So what kingdom is this? This is in the plant kingdom. The division is seed bearing. The subdivision is angiosperm. The class is monocotyledon or monocot for short. The order is liliaceae, and the family is liliaceae. This is the genus and this is the species. Then we have the variety. And for the common name, we have snake plant, golden banded cerechiaceae, and mother-in-law's tongue. So if we write the cultivar name, we have the scientific name, which is the genus, the species, and then the cultivar. In addition to genus and species, sometimes it's necessary to add on a cultivar or variety because new plants and mutations happen all the time in nature. And plant breeders work to make specific plants have a specific characteristic, such as taste or coloring. To distinguish these plants from the parent plant, a third part of the name is added, which is variety or cultivar. So variety is a species with inheritable differences from the straight species, and is also the subgrouping of that species assigned to individuals displaying unique differences in the natural population. These are naturally bred from true seed, which means if you plant the seed, you'll have the same variety. A cultivar, on the other hand, is asexually cloned or uh, controlled sexually crossbred. So these are man-made. So if you want to continue growing this cultivar, you couldn't plant it by seed. You would um, would plant the asexually propagated plants. Now we're going to cover the rules for writing scientific names or binomial names. First we write the genus and then the species and then the cultivar. The genus is always capitalized, whereas the species is not. Then we have CV standing for cultivar, or if it's variety, we put V. Genus is always capitalized, followed by the specific epiphyte, which is the species, beginning with a lowercase letter. Both are italicized. If you can't italicize, you can also underline them. Any variety name follows the genus and the species, and it can be designated with V or VAR. The abbreviation CV is used for cultivar. Single quotes around the variety or cultivar name can substitute this var or cv. In conclusion, remember to always italicize the genus and species. Genus needs to be capitalized, whereas species does not. Let's review what we've covered so far today. We talked about plant taxonomy and how it's helpful for organized different plants into different groups. 
We also talked about the importance of the binomial naming system and how to write scientific names. I hope this was helpful. Please subscribe, reply with any comments or ideas for future videos, and feel free to email me with any questions. Have a great day.